All right, so we're going to take you through now the, the main part of uh, our Smart Aid system and, and process. So for those of you that, that don't know us uh, and myself at, at TACMED, um, my name's Jeremy Holder. I'm the founder and managing director of TACMED Australia. We're, we're a veteran-owned first aid company. Um, ten years, we've been in business for 10 years. We've just hit our 10-year anniversary. And we specialise in bridging that gap between what we learn as military medics on the battlefield and that battlefield tactical medicine. And we, and we bridge that gap and we, to between traditional first aid and, and what we learn on the battlefield. So we're a, we're a team of 15 full-time staff and we've got about 30, 40 casual instructors around Australia um, that teach a lot of our training programs. Um, a, lot of got, a lot of us come from a military special operations background as medics. Um, and then we also have a bunch of civilian paramedics and, and things like that as well. So all of our training team are all uh, very highly experienced uh, clinicians. Um, we've been running training, obviously, for most of our 10 years, uh, but we only really kicked off uh, about five years ago. And then in 2016, we've become an RTO um, as well. So we've delivered, uh, I think we deliver about 100 training courses uh, a year. Most of those are multi-day. Uh, to government agencies. But one of the things we're best known for is we developed the first a tactical first aid program for Queensland Police. And we're really proud that those guys have done an amazing job and built a capability um, through the train the trainer program and equipment we've delivered. And they've saved over 40 people's lives in the last two years since that's been rolled out. Uh, and at the end of last year, it won, a, uh, it won an award for innovation at the World Policing Awards in, in London, which was, uh, which was super cool. Um, I myself start, obviously started as a medic and then, uh, and then after seven years as a, as a medic, including deployment to Afghanistan with the commandos, counter-terrorism, uh, moved on to become an intensive care paramedic in Sydney uh, and then obviously the business. My hobby, which was this business, turned, uh, turned into a real business and uh, so I, I left the ambulance uh, full-time. I still remain, I still do one shift a month or so to, uh, to keep my, my finger in the pie in the clinical um, and so that's a little bit about me. So how did we come up with Smart Aid? So for us, you know, as I said, we, we train around about 1,500 non-medical people uh, a year. Um, most of those being police around, this, you know, around Australia and, and whatnot is, is probably our, our main um, sort of students or clientele that we teach. Um, we deliver accredited training through under the auspices of our, of our sister company, an RTO, so TACMED Training. Uh, is an RTO, um, and so we we mix between accredited and non-accredited. You know, bringing that T that tactical emergency casualty care, our, our tactical medicine side with the normal accredited RTO stuff, and we combine that. So we deliver a lot of uh, courses that combine CPR and trauma. So most of these courses are, are short duration, as I said. So normally they're um, we do run some single day courses, but a lot of them are two day courses. And then we find even in two days, it's, it's a short duration to teach what we want to teach. And not just the theory and the, uh, the skills that we want to teach them, but to give them the confidence that they can do that, to try and build that, I hate using the term muscle memory, but to start building that repetition into the skills and the, to do reality-based training and scenarios, uh, it takes time. So two days is, is not a lot, time, a lot of time, even to run our basic um, courses. So with that, one of the one of the tr the struggles that we found was that a lot of people had the di had difficulty comprehending uh, the DRS ABCDE or ABCD that would teach for the CPR component, um, and then we would teach them the March component. A lot of you would be familiar with March that we use in the military as a primary assessment. So the massive hemorrhage, airway, respirations, circulation, head injury, hypothermia. Sometimes we put an E on the end for everything else. Um, and so people would have trouble, you know, we'd have to teach them the DRS, ABCDE, and then we'll go, all right, that's for cardiac arrest. We now want you to learn about, we now want to teach you March, which we're going to use in trauma. Uh, and so over a short period of time for non-medical people, it is, we found they had the trouble comprehending that and trying to learn it in a short period of time. So this is the basis for us to start coming up with, um, start coming up with the smart uh, concept. So Smart Aid combines our traditional first aid and CPR treatment methods that most of you are aware of 
And we combine that with the military trauma primary survey March. So we like to think, and so we've come up with SMART, which is the scene safety and security, the massive hemorrhage, airways, respirations and resuscitation. And then our T's are our trauma, temperature and transport. Now, this is, I like to think we're not recreating the wheel here for some people. Um, I just like to think we're polishing the wheel and we're, and we're just modifying the wheel for what works for us as a training company for the clientele that we teach. Um, and that includes uh, a lot of high risk businesses is what we specialize in uh, as well. Not just the tactical, we do a lot um, for high risk um, business and organizations. So we love March. There's nothing wrong with March in a tactical context. There's probably nothing wrong with, well, there's nothing wrong with March in a trauma context. I believe maybe even New South Wales Ambulance are looking at using March for their, their trauma uh, only now in 2020. Um, it's been around for, for quite a period of time. I think it's been around, I think 2008, uh, it was started to use by the PJs. There is some conjecture it may have come up, been developed in the UK, but I think it's sort of become used in mass by the power rescuemen in the US in 2008. So it's been around for a little while and, and we're big believers in it. As I said, the issues we had was trying to teach, uh, you know, non, uh, non-medical civilians, uh, DRS, ABCDE for uh, resuscitation and then try to teach them March uh, in a one to two day course. It was just um, difficult from an education standpoint. So we come up uh, with SMART to work for us in a, uh, in a civilian non-medical context. So SMARTO really focuses on treating the preventable causes of death. To simplify that, we teach stop bleeding and keep breathing. That's it. A lot of you are probably really familiar with the term, um, you know, air goes in and out, blood goes round and round. Any variation of that is bad. Um, Dr. Ken, uh, I forgot to, 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 what's Ken's last name? Uh, he's an anaesthetist from CareFlight who I think come up with the, uh, that blood goes round and round. Air goes in and out uh, probably about 20 years ago, certainly as a, as a young, uh, as a young 17, 18 year old medic, that was a term that we used to use. Uh, a lot. So this is very similar. We just want to stop bleeding and keep our patient breathing. So we're going to focus on those preventable causes of death. So our smart primary assessment, as I said, is a core skill for first responders. And, and at TACMED, we say first responders are anybody that is going to lay that first dressing, the first uh, treatment to that casualty, whether at, you know, in a workplace or in a civilian setting. So they are a first responder. They are that first person on scene. So for them, it's one of the core skills is to be able to do a primary assessment. Um, you know, for us, SMART is a framework and it's a process. So whilst you're under stress, um, the you to systematically find and treat those preventable causes of death. So we, you know, most, most of us know that even in a metro area, um, that an urgent response time for an ambulance is around about that 10 minute mark. The statewide average, I think is 10.5 or 10.4 minutes or something like that for an urgent sort of uh, job. So we want to be able to, those 10 minutes can make a massive difference to the outcome of that patient. So we want to make sure that that person has a way that they can under stress, be able to find and treat those, uh, those injuries. Um, so our smart system is a, is a treat as you find uh, approach. So, it's ordered in the way that's going to kill you first. And so we want to treat, we want to find and treat those things in the order that's going to kill them. Now we, I have designed it as a scalable system. So whether you are a non-medical first responder in a workplace uh, or you're an intensive care paramedic uh, or a military medic or something like that, this system still is scalable. So you still can, um, scale it so for the t's and i don't put this in there because you know we don't have a graphic designer on in-house here um for the t's we can put in therapeutics as well so if you want to talk about doing medications and ivs and things like that you know blood products um you can do that in the t's that we'll talk about uh same with resuscitation as well so if you're able to do supraglottic airways or intubations uh rsis 
uh, and things like that. You would do that at appropriate time in airway uh, and or resuscitation when you do that. So it is a scalable system. So the first part of it, and this is one of the big things that we found when teaching uh, non-medical personnel, that certainly in CPR, you know, a lot of people, you think about the CPR, and I know there's a quite a few trainers that are, that are listening in uh, to this now. Um, you know, when we do our CPR scenarios, you know, how many times do you actually put danger in the scenario? Or, you know, throw, me, throw it in the comments. If you regularly do that, uh, you know, we'd love to know. And if, even if you do, uh, I think most of the time that person will then mitigate that risk, stop that, uh, sort of try and change that danger or move the casualty. And then that's it. It's sort of out of the system. They never go back to danger. We know that the pre-hospital environment is such a dynamic environment. And just because we mitigate a threat or a danger initially doesn't mean that, that that's going to be not come back or a new threat uh, or arises. So we're really massive on that uh, situational awareness and situational uh, response. We're huge on it. Uh, so we'll teach it all throughout our treatment regimes. Um, so it's really massive for that scene safety and security. And we just harp on situational awareness. I think, and I always say to people, and for those of you who have been on, on one of my courses, like the king of situational awareness is Jason Bourne. You know, for those of you who've seen all that, the, uh, the Bourne movies, you know, he, he's always predicting what's going to happen next. He knows where he needs to be. He knows where he needs to stand. He needs where he's looking. He's predicting what's going to happen next and always been that one step ahead. So to me, that's, that is like, you know, even that's fake. That is the gold standard of situational awareness is that Jason Bourne. And then what is that response we're going to have to that uh, awareness? So for scene safety and security, it's maintaining that it's not a, uh, it's not a, um, it's not linear, it's a dynamic environment. So we need to maintain that throughout. So obviously we want to secure the scenes from any threats or hazards. Uh, and again, this is where we can use smart in a tactical and non-tactical point of view. Um, if it's police, their threat mitigation is going to be different to firefighters, uh, which is going to be different from people working uh, in a warehouse or in a manufacturing facility. Uh, it's going to be very different. So it's, it's how we maintain that scene safety and also security. Uh, this is where we talk about communication. It's really important that we uh, communicate uh, to obviously our patient, but our colleagues. Uh, we call for backup from triple uh, zero here in Australia. Um, so it's really important that we maintain that communication throughout. So we have our means of doing that. If we can't mitigate that security or stop that threat, then this is where we consider moving our casualty to a safer uh, location. Uh, you know, we talk about, I see some notes there about fires. You know, fire's a prime example. The chance of you putting out a fire straight away is pretty slim. So what do you do? You take your patient away from the fire. So we do have to move our casualties in certain circumstances. So a, uh, a scene that is not safe or secure is going to kill us and possibly kill some other first responders and bystanders and things like that. So we want to make sure that's the first thing we look at. The next thing that's going to kill us next is massive hemorrhage or massive bleeding. So in this, we're going to do a blood sweep. And we're going to look for life-threatening uh, bleeds. And the way that I tell people this is if you come across a bleed and it makes you almost say, oh, shit, and want to take a step back, if you can smell the blood, if it's spurting, if it's just saturating the clothing, then that is a, uh, a massive bleed. So that can kill someone um, as quick as three to five minutes. So we want to make sure we find it and we treat it. So we do a blood sweep looking at the, uh, looking at the neck, armpits, arms, groin, and legs, especially focusing in on those neck, armpit, groins, and extremities because you're got some big blood vessels, they're close to the surface, especially with our junctions, like our neck and armpits and groin. So they're on a joint, so they've got big blood vessels that can get uh, injured and lacerated uh, quite easily because uh, they're really close to the surface, hence why you can take a pulse in, uh, in those locations. The other thing is those, it, those are the areas that we, they're compressible bleeds. So they're major, they're a bleed that we can actually treat. Think about it. So any major bleeds that are in your chest, abdomen, pelvis, do they need us or do they need a surgeon? They need a surgeon. So they're a compressible bleed as opposed to the chest, abdomen, pelvis, which are non-compressible uh, bleeds. 
we can do some stuff with pelvis, but I, I think even there, there's not a lot of data that suggests that, uh, that our, our pelvic binders and splints are amazing. Uh, so the treatment that we do, and remember, it's a treat as you find method. So the treatments we're going to do is we're going to do tourniquets, arterial tourniquets for extremities. We can do wound packing on extremities and also uh, our, especially our junctions. If we've got a hemostatic dressing, then that's ideal. Uh, your normal trauma dressings. I mean, we certainly harp on about wound packing and tourniquets, but at the end of the day, a normal trauma dressing uh, you know, we love our Elias bandage. We love our Israeli, our emergency bandages. Uh, majority of the time, those trauma dressings can stop. I would say, I'm totally going to throw a random stat out, um, you know, 95% of wounds, you know. I, I think about my 10 years, 11 years working uh, on an ambulance in New South Wales. I've done, I think, three or four, definitely under half a dozen arterial tourniquets in that time. I've done three wound packs in that time. Um, how many trauma, trauma dressings? I don't know. It, I don't know. In ton, I'd say hundreds, hundreds of trauma dressings, and mo and they have majority of the time stopped those bleeding. So don't underestimate a bleed like a trauma dressing and how many like a type of bleed that it can stop. Uh, and then obviously in, in recent times we're looking at our junctional tourniquets like our double AJTs. Um, our SAMs, um, our Crocs and things like that, the Jet, North American Rescue Jet. So they're a junctional tourniquet for our uh, neck, armpits and groins. So massive hemorrhage, blood sweep, treat as you find. So the next thing we're going to look at is airway. So we're going to check that airway for a partial or complete obstruction. Okay, so next thing, once we've stopped major bleeding, an obstructed airway is going to be a thing that's going to kill our patient next. Okay, so uh, if we become hypoxic, uh, our brain will start to die very quickly. So we want to check also throughout this check our conscious state. So we use the ABPU. So for those of you who haven't heard of that, the alert, verbal, pain, and unresponsive. Again, this is where it becomes scalable. So if you're a paramedic and you're confident in doing a GCS, when you come back, I wouldn't do a GCS in initial primary survey. AVPU is generally what I do. When I come back and reassess that patient uh, a second time, I'll do a complete GCS uh, in that. So because I, I definitely want to check respirations and stuff before I start doing GCSs. <clears throat> so patients that are talking uh, or crying, we're going to assume they have an open airway for now. Obviously, when you're treating people with burns and chemicals and poisons and stuff like that, um, you know, even looking at some medical issues like croup and um, epiglottitis and things like that, they may have an airway initially and it can deteriorate. But generally speaking, if the patient's talking or crying at you, they've got an open airway at that time. Obviously, our patients that, have, that are unconscious uh, or have a decreased level of consciousness, consciousness like pain uh, and verbal, um, they're going to need a more detailed uh, assessment of their airway. So this is when we're going to open their airway and look for anything like blood, vomit, false teeth, uh, and stuff like that. As I said, this first time round, we're just going to do basic interventions. So we're going to do that triple airway manoeuvre. Uh, you know, we're going to do a chin lift, jaw thrust, head tilt. Um, we're going to do a sweep if need be. If you've got this gear, we're going to do some basic suctioning. Um, if they're unconscious, we may look at a Goodell airway or a nasopharyngeal, but that's about all we're going to do in that first round. Certainly, we're not going to be putting in LMAs and intubating before we've done any other assessments for respiration. So respirations and resuscitation. So this is where our SMART differs from, from DRS, ABCD and MARCH. So we're going to assess for the presence and adequacy of our respirations and our breathing. So uh, is it equal rise and fall? Is it deep? Is it shallow? Um, and is it adequate? So normally we say if it's under four to six rest per minute, it's probably not adequate for a normal person. Um, if they're not breathing or it's not adequate, this is when we're going to commence resuscitation. So this is when we're going to start on our 30 compressions to two breaths. Uh, or if you're not willing to do those uh, mouth to mouth, 
we don't have the, the bag valve mass resuscitator or things like that, we're going to do the hands only uh, compressions. If they are breathing, we're going to start doing our rub and rake uh, of the chest. Um, so we will do some generally rub down limbs. So when you're, um, or rub down, and then we rake up. And especially for low light areas, if they've been in a trauma, like a gunshot wound, a stabbing, uh, you know, even if, you know, you look at all the riots around the world at the moment with homemade explosives and, and homemade mortars and stuff. I was just watching a video of a mortar um, at one of the riots. Um, when you rake, your fingers are going to drop into any ripped clothing from, uh, from the trauma or any wounds. So this, especially if it's a low light and you haven't got a good torch or a uh, night time, the rake is really good. Treatment for this, for respirations, obviously in resuscitation, it's going to be our CPR. Um, however, in our uh, normal respirations is going to be um, decompression, if you're qualified with a needle, uh, chest seals, if they've got penetrating chest trauma, and oxygen, uh, if required, and if you've got it. So they're going to be our initial uh, treatment in uh, respirations and resuscitation. So the next part of it is our T's, our trauma, temperature, and transport. And as I said, I've added, uh, it's not on our posters or any of our, our uh, sort of collateral that we'll use, that we use from uh, SMART. Uh, but if you're an advanced provider, so sort of paramedic level uh, above, um, we can put in therapeutics uh, there as well. So this is where we're going to fully expose any wounds and control any unrecognized bleeding. So if you've previously in the massive hemorrhage applied a tourniquet, done a wound packing or anything like that, we're going to go by and expose and make sure they're still effective. Um, any movement obviously can change the, uh, the wound profile and can, and can start bleeding again. Um, this is where any non-life-threatening bleeds, that's when you're going to treat them. If you've put on a tourniquet but it's still a big wound cavity, we're going to pack it and wrap it. Um, so any, any unrecognized bleeding or non-life-threatening bleeding, this is where we're going to treat it in trauma. As I said, we're going to recheck. We're going to assess our abdomen and our pelvis. And again, for the abdo, we're going to look for any, uh, any pain, any guarding, any rigidity, any signs of an internal bleed in the abdominal cavity. And we're going to assess the pelvis for any, uh, any sort of fractures or pain, bleeding, internal bleeding for that. Again, treat as you find. So if you are worried about either the mechanism or the actual pelvis itself, we're going to treat it with a pelvic binder, bring the legs together and throw on a triangle of bandage there. Any other trauma, so we look at our burns and our fractures, we're going to treat them uh, in trauma. We then got temperature, as I said, the therapeutics and transport. So this is when we're going to look at our vital signs. And again, for even the basic people, we're going to do uh, pulses, uh, capillary refill. We're going to look at their skin for perfusion to look at their vital signs. If you're qualified, we'll look at the IV, IO access and fluids in that therapeutics part. And this is really massive. Don't underestimate the hypothermia, the temperature of SMART. So we know that our cold trauma patients die. So patients that have a core body temperature, they rock up to a resus bay after being treated uh, out in the field, on the streets, whatever. Ambulance brings them in and they hit the resus bay with a core body temperature of 34 degrees in major trauma. So we're not talking about someone who sprained their ankle on the soccer field, like a proper, properly injured patient, critically ill patient. Under 34 degrees, they have a 60% chance of mortality at 30 days. If their core body temperature drops below 32 degrees Celsius, uh, they have 100% mortality. Okay, so for those of you that do a little bit of research and know your, uh, your sort of injury, injury severity scores, uh, we're talking about critically uh, injured patients here, not patients that just have fractures of, of single limbs and things like that. So it's really important that we keep our trauma patients warm. And so this is why we push this in our courses for the non-medical people. So, you know, your lay person, we will push on that hypothermia management because it makes a huge difference for the outcome of that patient uh, later on down the track. Really important that we keep them 
nice and warm. So we should talk, tell them about all the, uh, we'll teach all the, uh, the management of hypothermia in there. The next part of this is preparing our patient from transport. And this, this <coughs> excuse me, context is gonna depend on where you are, what's the evacuation time, can an ambulance or the rescue personnel uh, reach you? <coughs> Excuse me. So we need to prepare our uh, patient for transport. And this can be some, some minor things, preparations we do, or it could involve a full extrication to the waiting ambulance, depending on where you are. If you're out in the bush in the Blue Mountains, um, or you're on a construction site that, that a lot of normal medical personnel can't get to. Um, <coughs> you may look at preparing your patient to extricate them uh, for transport. So that's the T's and that's our smart primary assessment. So it's not a set and forget. Uh, it's a flywheel. As you can see here, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor. Scene safety, security, massive hemorrhage, airway, respirations, and we come back and we do it all again like a flywheel. We keep coming back to reassessing our massive hemorrhage, our airways, our respirations, uh, obviously resuscitation, uh, we'll continue that if need be. Trauma, temperature and transport, therapeutics if you're available. It's more than just resuscitation and it's more than just march. It's combining the two and we put a lot of emphasis on that situational awareness, huge. We'll do a scene scan brief between each part of our primary survey. It's about communication to your patient, to your colleagues, to the attending uh, emergency services, if applicable. As I said, it's a scalable uh, with the, depending on your, your clinical level. Again, if we're running a CERT two level medical service first response course, uh, the level of de you know the level of interventions will differ than if we're running um, our four hour smart course. So it's going to be very very different uh, on the level. So it's scalable, and again, it's not reinventing the wheel. We're looking at it as making the wheel uh, the right size uh, and tight for what we do uh, through TACMED. So we're combining both that resus and that trauma for generally non uh, medical personnel. So that is our TACMED Smart Aid and the Smart Patient Assessment uh, mnemonic. Let me 